Uh, good morning, and can I welcome everybody to the 19th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2014. Uh, can I can remind all those present that electronic devices should be switched off because they do interfere with the broadcasting system. Um, can I welcome Joan McAlpine uh, to the committee as a substitute for George, George Adam. We we'll received apologies from George uh, and also apologies from uh, Liam MacArthur this morning. Uh, and I, can I welcome everybody back in August to the Parliament, which is a slightly unusual uh, event, but um, I'm sure um, it's nonetheless welcome. Uh, the sole item on our agenda today is to get an update on the report that we published uh, in terms of our inquiry into decision-making on whether to take children into care. Um, we published the report almost a year ago, members will remember, uh, and it gave a clear commitment that we would return to the issue in the future, uh, and obviously this is part of that uh, commitment. We have spent a great deal of time looking at this issue, both in the inquiry and, of course, um, in the bill, the subsequent bill on children and young people. Um, and we want to, I think it's fair to say, maintain the momentum of the work that we undertook uh, over the last couple of years um, and making sure that public bodies, government and others who are involved in this issue are responding appropriately to the challenges that we laid out in our report. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome this morning Who Cares Scotland to the committee. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, they and indeed the young people uh, that they support um, and represent provided, I have to say, I think it's fair to say, invaluable support to the committee uh, during our inquiry. Uh, and we thank you very much again for uh, that support. Uh, before I invite an opening statement from Who Cares Scotland, uh, I should point out that Ashley, uh, if she doesn't mind me saying so, um, uh, is it fair to say you won the NUS Scotland uh, Student of the Year Award, is that correct? I did, thank well, you. Well, congratulations. Thank you very on much. That. Uh, I'm sure it was well deserved. Um, and I think, I hope it doesn't embarrass Ashley to say, I, I know Ashley has been involved in the whole inquiry and has been very helpful to us during that. But Ashley, I think, has done not just great work with helping us in the, the committee, but obviously has gone on to do fantastic work and has been recognised now by the NUS in terms of her Student of the Year Award. So again, well done uh, to Ashley. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Who Cares Scotland for around 15 minutes or so, um, who are going to give us a, a presentation and give us their views on the report and, and the progress that has been made thus far. And I'm sure they won't miss the opportunity to point out some of the challenges uh, and some of the uh, issues that are still facing uh, children and young people today in Scotland. So I'm going to hand over to Duncan. Thank you very much. I'm actually going to hand over to Ashley. Well, it's Ashley. <laughs> Ashley, then. <laughs> thank you. First of all, I want to say thanks. <clears throat> I am genuinely sitting here today a different person from the one you met a year ago. I am braver. I am stronger. I am more committed than ever to achieve, to buck the trend, to lead by example. That is why I'm delighted to be here today, to explain the impact you listening to me and others like me has had. I am pleased to confirm that more than we ever thought possible has come from this relationship. And yes, we do believe we have a relationship with this committee, and we are very proud to say that. You invited us in when others were locking us out, a lot of the time subconsciously. <clears throat> I want to introduce to you, sorry. <clears throat> I want to introduce you to my colleagues and friends who are here today. You all know Duncan Dunlop, our CEO at Who Cares Scotland. After I have had a chat with you, I will pass you on to Thomas Timlin, who is a qualified social worker and has care experience. He will then hand on to Caroline Richardson, who is a Who Cares Scotland advocacy and participation manager, and who also has care experience. Finally, but by no means least, Kevin Brown, the senior corporate parenting officer at Who Cares Scotland, who also has care experience. They will all discuss with you the impact of the decision-making process on looked-after children and will use their personal and professional experiences to discuss how these decisions need to place young people at the absolute heart to ensure they are involved, listened to and ultimately have a voice. When I was first asked to give evidence to this inquiry by the Scottish Parliament, I didn't have much reason to hope for a better life for myself, never mind future generations of Scotland's children. My life was full of broken promises. My path to a brighter future was blocked. I have shared with you my care experience, and I don't want to repeat that in full. But please know, my care experience created that blocked path. 
and I wasn't sure giving evidence to this committee would help knock down those blocks. But I knew I trusted Who Cares Scotland. I listened to Denny Ford when he was explaining to me what this inquiry was for, what it could do, how I could play a role. I decided to go for it, and I'm so glad I did. That first day in Who Cares Scotland offices on the 17th of December 2012 was intense. Afterwards, I felt drained. I felt I had finally let everything out. And kind of like taking a huge leap of faith, I put faith in those listening to do something with what they had heard from me and my other amazingly strong and brave peers, many of whom sit behind me. Those people listening were you. The period right up to the final inquiry report being published on the 23rd of September 2013 saw a lot of my faith paying off. In fact, I had never felt so accepted, positive, respected, understood, listened. Actually, I felt liberated. I felt my time was here to carve out a new path, one filled with educational achievements, career ambitions, friends, family, and of course, my beautiful dogs at home. I had a future. Not only was I and Scotland's children being listened to, but for the first time in my life, I started listening to myself. I managed with help the ups and downs of sharing me with this parliament. Sometimes they made me feel sad, sore, emotional, and down. Saying it all out loud, and bearing in mind I was now listening to myself and starting to believe too. This made me realize that I had had a raw deal in life. If it wasn't for a handful of people who believed in me and loved me for who I was, then I may have thrown in the towel. This is where Mary Bateman, my advocacy worker, comes in. She has seen every single part of me. In fact, she embraced me and all parts of my ID way before I did. She was by my side, when decisions were getting made about my life, she was always right there. Life was tough in care, but I know it could have been a lot worse if it wasn't for Mary. I wish every one of Scotland's children had a Mary, because see what this committee did in this inquiry by inviting us, listening and acting. That's what Mary does every single day for children and young people just like me. She has no idea of the light and the love that she brings into my life. Let me give you a wee update on what I've achieved over the past year. And please know that if I had not started this conversation with this committee back in December 2012, I really am not sure I would be able to tell you what I'm about to. <clears throat> I started working with Who Cares Scotland, having taken advantage of a community jobs funded post which they had secured and I have loved it. I helped kickstart the national campaign asking Scotland to listen to looked after children. And now I'm one of the faces of that campaign, which has grown arms and legs. <clears throat> I overcame about a one in a 251,000 chance of becoming NUS Scotland Student of the Year. Me, who was on my third chance at further education, I'd never won anything in my life. Then myself, along with those who also gave evidence to this committee, some of whom are sitting behind me, were awarded the Young Scot Community Award and the overall Young Scots of the Year Award 2014 for what we had done. Can you imagine what that felt like? Being stars for a night, being recognized, being praised, being us. Having us and our identities not only recognised, but being judged in a good way, the best way. In fact, most of Scotland's children in care don't get judged in a good way. And they all deserve to feel ultimately what we did that night. I am off to study a BSc in politics and social policy in September at Stirling University. And I cannot wait. Me, a graduate? Bring it on. In fact, one MSP raised a motion to congratulate me on my achievements. And the First Minister wrote me a personal letter. Can you imagine what that feels like to me, coming from the childhood that I've had? I want every single one of Scotland's children to have a year like I have had, or their equivalent. 
Every other parent strives for this for their own children. They help them find their voice, grow as a person, dream about their futures, and never ever lose hope or faith in who they are. We need our corporate parents to, do that, to want this for us. Why? Because people are interested in what we have to say, and change is possible. In fact, change is inevitable. This journey with you in this committee has inspired me to want to sit where you are in 10 years' time. You have sent a strong message to every single MSP and decision maker in this parliament and beyond. And we have sent a strong message of hope and change to Scotland's children and young people. To quote that famous phrase of past campaigners, nothing about us, without us, is for us. Because when you bring us in, include us from the absolute start, then we can do change together, with each other, guiding each other, using each other. That's democracy. And what we have seen with this inquiry is democracy in action. And I will do all I can to ensure it continues. I am now going to pass you on to Thomas Timlin, who will explain his consequences of not being involved in the decisions made in his life. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Thomas Timlin. A bit like Ashley, who you know, and Kevin and Caroline, who you will hear from, I could also be considered a successful care leaver. I am currently a development officer with Who Care Scotland. I have graduated as a qualified social work practitioner in 2014 and was awarded the Munson Trophy from the University of the, War of the West of Scotland. During my time with Who Care Scotland, whilst providing adv advocacy for individuals and groups, I have heard many young people share their experiences with others. In doing so, they have challenged oppression, inspired change and found their voice. This led to the most important changes in the law for over a generation. That is why being involved in decision making matters and it is why, in turn, I am here to share my experiences. Because throughout my time in care, I was not included in decisions that were made about me. For many young people, what happened in this committee was unique. It was the first time they felt they had been actively listened to. This committee legitimised the care identity. The experience was an empowering one, but not just for those who met with you. I was empowered too, and it is why I am here today. I wanted you to know that your actions went much further than in this room. I was born into a large family, and I am part of a sibling group of seven. My family began engaging with social work services six years prior to my birth. In and out of care, my twin and I were always placed together. But we were never sure when we would see our siblings again. From birth, I was used, I was used to moving backwards and forwards, from a formal care placement to back home with my birth parents. I never questioned this because it was my reality. My reality was also social workers, coming in and out of the family home, and my time with parents abruptly coming to an end. Sometimes because neighbours would hear my mum and dad trashing the place. Sometimes because social workers would find us in carrier bags instead of nappies. Sometimes because my parents had taken to squatting in order to get us a house with a back and front door. My life was full of change, and I don't remember being asked what I wanted. Life was a mixture of new foster families, new schools, and new cultures. Once accommodated, I would not see my parents for several months. I wouldn't see my brothers and sisters, and I wouldn't know where I was going. My longest foster placement lasted for around three years. From the age of three until just before I was seven. And unfortunately, it wasn't good. In 2013, after I was required to give evidence in court for two full days, my foster mother was found guilty of abuse towards other young people and myself. The experience was traumatic, and I had to relive my childhood with certain aspects being laboured during the trial. 
This was my life, my story, being lived out in court, and none of it on my own terms. After the trial, I was approached by various newspapers, journalists, and lawyers. This almost broke me. People wanted to talk to me about the consequences of the decisions that were made about me. If only they showed that interest when the decisions were being made. After the sheriff found my foster mother guilty, he stated that the conditions and I and the other young people described during evidence would match a Dickensian description for life for deprived Victorian children. The care system and everyone involved in it told me that life with my birth parents was wrong, so I assumed that where they were putting me would be right. Unfortunately, it was those Dickensian conditions that became my new reality. Now, at the age of seven, I might not have been able to articulate what was going on. At such a young age, I was not even able to identify that the way I was being treated was unfair, never mind criminal. But if I had had someone that I had a relationship with whose only obligation was to me, perhaps things would have turned out differently. Look, I wasn't a bad child. I didn't ask, and I didn't deserve any of this. No one does. My belief at the time was that I was being treated in a particular way because of me, who I was, and because of something that I was doing. The belief I held was completely wrong. I was not a bad child, and my social, workers, my social work record sorry, continually described me as a young child who was eager to please everyone. When I was around the age of six, my older sister told my twin and I that adoption plans were being put in place for us to be adopted alongside our younger sister. We were to be adopted together. I remember my twin and I running around the living room. I was ecstatic. I was going to get a real proper family, something I had never experienced. I was finally going to get things that I could say belonged to me. A home, a mum, a dad, just a family. What I don't remember, however, is being asked whether I wanted to be adopted or being given any choice. The day I had to say goodbye to my biological mother was the saddest day of my life so far. I can still feel that pain talking about it today. Imagine being told that you're never going to see your mother again. Now imagine having no one to talk to about it. Imagine being told that, it's, uh, that now it's time to move on because the decision has been made and that's that. Unfortunately, contact with my other siblings did not continue either. Despite all of us being promised that we would always get to see each other. This happened abruptly and we didn't get to say goodbye to each other. It just stopped. No one asked what I wanted. We just didn't get to see them for what we thought would be forever. There was no one to make sure I had a voice. At times, life with my adoptive family was challenging. And unfortunately, I can't offer this committee a happy ending. What we thought was going to be our forever family ended the day of our 16th birthday, when my twin and I woke up alone. This time, the house might have been furnished, the water might have been hot, and the cupboards might have been full. But again, we were still alone. For my younger sister, who was under the age of 16, another placement move was on the horizon. For my brother and I, our care journey ended with us sleeping by psychopaths and in railway stations. Excuse me. We went in entitled to support and we had no one to talk to about what had happened, what's going to happen next. At this time, we could have used that person I spoke about earlier, whose only obligation would have been to me. 
we could have used this more than ever. To this day, I struggle with trusting others and allowing others to be kind to me. I fear being let down, rejected and abandoned. I believe this is because I have never had someone who has been continuous in my life, anyone who has shown me unconditional love or even unconditional positive regard. Access to an advocate would not only have assisted me in my most challenging times, it would have better placed me in my endeavour towards self-actualisation. For example, my year at college and four years at university, I had to work full time to support myself. An advocate would have made me aware of the funding I was entitled to. When I have been anxious and worried, alone, an advocate would have been a confidential, open ear, someone who I could trust, whose only obligation would be to me. I'd like to thank you all for listening to me today. This is the first time I've ever spoke publicly about my care experience. Um, so thank you very much. I feel very privileged and honoured. Um, I would like to pass on to my colleague, Caroline. Um, thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Good morning. My name is Caroline Richardson, and I am an advocacy and participation manager with Who Cares Scotland and also a care leaver. I'm here this morning to share with you my personal journey. The purpose of this is to demonstrate how outcomes have not changed for care leavers since I left care in 1989, the year the UNCRC was ratified in the UK. Having worked as an advocate, I've had first-hand experience of amplifying the voices of young people in care who are not at the heart of the decision-making processes. And let us never underestimate the amount of decisions made on behalf of these young people before, during and after care. I was taken into care at the age of four. No explanation was given why I could not live with my dad. And I don't think at that age I would have understood. Throughout my pe first period of care, my relationship with my family became strained. We became strangers. I went back to live with my family at the age of 10 due to the children's home closing down. Things very quickly deteriorated within my family home. When I did see my social worker, I would often say how unhappy I was at home and that I felt I should return to care. Unfortunately, it took for a serious incident to occur before I was returned. Very quickly, however, plans were put in place to rehabilitate me back home. I returned once more to the family home again and things broke down. So when I returned back to care, my confidence and self-esteem was low and that manifested itself in my behaviour. I started mixing with inappropriate peers and getting myself into trouble. After not being listened to for so long, I eventually got support from my guidance teacher at school. She said that she would support me to get my point of view across. She advocated for me at meetings and helped pay people listen to how I was feeling. Unfortunately, she moved to another job and very quickly I was being told the best place for you is back with your family. My advocacy support disappeared as I had no right to it. I went home for the third time and things deteriorated to the point where when I was taken into care for the last time, I lost contact with my family for several years after that. So having experienced seven placement moves and three periods at home, I was finally moved to foster carers at the age of 15. They provided me with a nurturing and stable environment, and I thrived. At the age of 17, I was encouraged by my social worker to move to my own tenancy. Being a teenager who thought she knew it all, I readily agreed, but very quickly realised it was a mistake. Once in my own tenancy, my case was closed by social work, and I was on my own. I struggled as I had no idea how to budget, how to pay bills, or how to live appropriately within a community. I just remember that having lived in group living for so long, the silence was deafening. At this point, I felt embarrassed about my care experience and chose to move on with my life, keeping my past quiet. The Children and Young People Act will at least enable care leavers now to get the support that they need when they need it. It was only when I joined Who Care Scotland as an independent advocate, I realised that things for care leavers had not changed much 
since I left care. Despite major advances in legislation, policies, procedures, the young people still felt that they had no voice. They were not listened to and their outcomes were still very poor. Working as an advocate, I was able to challenge this on an individual basis, but the majority of care experienced young people still do not have a voice. During the evidence given process of this committee last year, I was in awe of care leavers like Ashley, how they talked about their care journeys and experiences and how they were prepared to use their experiences to make things better for young people in the future. Then I realised that what they were doing were creating a movement of change. They instilled in me a sense of pride in my care experience, which is why I now have the confidence to share this with you today. It was through this process that care leavers who shared their stories contributed to the changes in support for care leavers up to the age of 26, now contained within the Children and Young People's Act. And this will go a long way to improving outcomes for young people and care leavers in the future. Thank you. I would now like to pass you on to my colleague, Kevin. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Caroline. Um, my name is Kevin Brown, and like the others, I'm here today because I've got care experience. But I've all, I'm also a graduate. I'm a safeguarder. I've travelled the world. I've worked as an advocate, the same as Caroline. And in my earlier career, I spent four years working at the office of Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People. So all of this personal and professional experience has enabled me to develop a deep sense, um, a deep understanding of children's rights and the issues which affect looked after children. Currently, I'm the Senior Corporate Parenting Officer at Who Cares Scotland, and during this inquiry, I was responsible for engaging and supporting young people to articulate, process, and share their story with this committee. I myself was struck as to how little children and young people understood about their life, why decisions had been made, and their lack, their lack of involvement. I admired the way in which this committee listened to children and young people, and in turn, how this gave young people the courage and desire to share their stories with the hope of making a difference. Like Thomas, this process has inspired me, and behind my professional experience lies my own care experience. I've really spoken in depth or in public about this, and in many ways I've worn a mask since I left care due to the stigma and discrimination. It was the young people in this process of liberation which helped me and others to remove these masks and claim our care identity. This is something which I must credit to the committee, for it was you who started this whole process. Like our young people did during the inquiry, I would like to share a little of my own experience and the significance of getting decisions right. Similar to the others, a decision was made to take me into care at the age of three. During my care journey, I was separated from my brothers and sister who was adopted and I didn't see for 13 years. I experienced a number of foster placements, moved between nine residential houses, went to four different primary schools and I've been cared for by over 100 workers. And behind each of these moves, there was a decision. Decisions which changed, shaped, and impacted on me, my brothers, and my sister. And I'd like to share one of these with you. My two younger brothers, sorry, my two brothers were looked after from an early age like myself, and both had left care before they were 16. A decision was made to return them home and this, of course, broke down. At 16, they had little to no support, and it resulted in both of them experiencing homelessness and isolation. My oldest brother, Paul Brown, experienced mental health issues and hung himself at the age of 18. Five years later, my younger brother, Andrew Brown, overdosed on drugs at the age of 18. Two massive and life-changing decisions were made five years apart, yet they had the same outcome in the form of my two brothers dying. On one hand, on the other hand, sorry, I left care at the age of 18. 
I fought to stay, I spoke out, and I made sure that I was heard. I was able to advocate for myself. A few months ago, I wrote a personal letter to Aileen Campbell, the children's minister, to thank her for the difference that I believe the provisions within the Children and Young People Act will make and the added protection it should give young people in the form of continuing care. Why did I do this? Well, because I know more than anyone else in this room what the real impact and the what the real impact and consequences of making poor decisions can lead to. Whether it's children remaining at home too long, making decisions to send them back home, or whether it's deciding that they have to leave care at a young age. I don't know how I managed to become what people may describe as a successful care leaver, but what I do know is that I had advocacy at a young age, from the age of nine, this is when I started to understand my rights and found my voice. So what are the challenges that exist today? Well, in real terms, I see and still see people homeless and on the streets that I grew up with. And I have worked as an advocate with the children of people who I lived with. I always ask myself, where was their voice? Did they have one? Four weeks ago, I graduated from Strathclyde University, where I completed a degree in education and social services. My childhood and youth advocate, Ray McLean, was one of the people who I invited to celebrate this alongside me. I also invited my younger brother's foster family, Marion and Ed Crangle, as well as Tony MacDonald, a young person with care experience employed at Who Cares Scotland, because I wanted him and other young people with care experience to know that they can go to university and that they can achieve their ambitions, whatever these may be. I'd like to thank the committee for the way that they've listened to children and young people. And I believe the independence of this committee is a massive strength. It's my personal and professional view that all young people should have a right to independent advocacy to make sure that their voice is heard in all decisions. I know that my two brothers would have benefited from this and so would the thousands of young people who don't currently have this in Scotland. And just for a final kind of overall conclusion, you've heard from Ashley, Caroline, Thomas and myself today and we're all recommending the same. Young people need to be heard. They need to know that someone will be by their side when every single decision is being made and not just at the point of entering the care system. That someone must be separate from the systems and structures which govern the care system, truly independent. The consequences of good and bad decision making is clear. You know it and we know it. We thank you for listening. Thank you for welcoming us back and would now be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Kevin, um, can I, uh, certainly on behalf of the committee, thank all of you who have spoken this morning. I know it can't have been easy to have done so. Uh, these are difficult stories. Um, but can I, before I bring in my colleagues, can I ask a question about process? You raised the issue of process. Um, we, as a committee, took a decision um, before we started the inquiry to take evidence in a slightly different fashion than we normally would. Normally we would call for evidence, we would bring people in front of the committee like this in a formal session with everything being recorded and written down. That would be the normal process. Um, but we decided to do it slightly differently, as you'll remember. Um, and we, we, we met you, as you mentioned, um, in, in the Who Cares Scotland offices in Glasgow um, on a rather wet December day, if I remember rightly. Um, and from there, took us, we tried to take you and us, I think, through a process which would maximise your ability to give us the maximum amount of information and in input, but would allow us to get the maximum out of your evidence. Um, and we felt that that was done differently from the normal process of evidence taking. What I want to ask is... Um, what, how, you think, how you thought that went as a process? Because that was the first time 
this committee had done it, and I don't think any other committee has done it that way before. So I'd like to know how you felt that went, um, what was good about it, and what was bad about it, and what mistakes did we make? Um, because we want to try and learn from this experience as a committee um, about what, how we can best um, approach young people, particularly who are vulnerable or, or in care, or who have got difficult stories and different ex difficult experiences that can be very traumatic for them to relay to effectively who are a group of, a group of strangers. Um, so if you could maybe try and give us some of your thoughts on the process that we undertook so that we can learn uh, from your view, your view of that process, how you thought it went. <coughs> Sorry. Well, um, as I said um, just there, um, one of the things that I really loved about this evidence given was the fact that um, you know, you came into our space first and got to know us as people, um, which a lot of other people may not take the time to do. They may just go, well, tell us, and then we'll go away. Um, so I think that was the first thing, that you, know, that you came into our space rather than us coming to you. Because um, obviously it can be very daunting to, to share your, your care experiences. Um, it felt quite strange during the first evidence giving because you're not really sure of where it's going to go or you know what the, what any of you are going to take away from it ultimately um, but at the end it felt very good to have that release if you like because as I mentioned it was our first time speaking about before care experiences and um, so a lot of those emotions were still quite raw um, but I do think overall it was very well done in terms of, you know, the, the, the key points as to when when it all happened. Um, but I think ultimately it's, it's confirmed that what we're doing is right in terms of we're doing this to change the bigger picture. We're not doing it to change things for ourselves as individuals. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else want to comment? On the process? No. Yes, Kim. Yep. Um, I would say that for me, supporting uh, the young people, I, I felt the process was excellent. And what we found in kind of a, a, an analysis afterwards, um, and, and it came up during the process, was that it wasn't necessarily the way, the way in which it was done was excellent um, because we've got relationships with young people. Um, which secured their interest in giving evidence, and we used that um, in the right way so that they could share it with you for the purposes of the inquiry. But what, what we found where the learning was, was the majority of young people, if not all, it was astounding the lack of life story work that they had actually done. So what we found is that they had questions about their life that were unanswered for years and that when we started to explore giving evidence and we'd done the preparation sessions, they were discovering things about their self. They were th finding out things uh, from other young people about their kind of rights and what they could do and when decisions are made. And for some people, there was just a complete lack of understanding. And the majority of young people had not talked about their before care experience. So the learning for us is that professionals, social workers, whoever is supporting the young people, foster carers, need to be doing more life story work with young people. Because it came to a stage where some people were 18, 19, 20, and they didn't understand their life before care. And that was a process that we helped them with, but they also needed support from. So that was a kind of key learning for us. Thank you very much for that. Um, Colin, is this supplementary on this issue or is it moving on? It's, it's different. It's yes. different. Well, I'll bring in Mary first then. Mary. Well, thank you. Can I associate myself with the comments uh, of the uh, convener? I wasn't on the committee to hear all the evidence. I've only been here since March, but I totally agree with you. And if we don't listen to you, we're never going to get it right. And I'd like to thank everyone. I appreciate it wasn't easy to... Uh, to give the evidence, but thank you. Uh, can I just uh, sort of take this forward a step, although it might be a bit early? Uh, to me, the big challenge is now about implementation. You've been very complimentary about the committee, and we've got a very good Children and Young People Act. And 
I wonder if I can just take a step forward, because uh, I think it was, uh, Kevin, you said the systems and structures that govern the care system, and I think it's fair to say that they need to change as well. And if I could just very briefly kind of, um, uh, when we spoke to a relatively small number of young people, social workers must improve their communication skills. Uh, another one was there has to be a clearer fit between children's hearings and other looked after children's processes and uh, really to explain uh, to young people uh, there are also things like you know within the children's hearing system the delays and blaming social work for delays in their reports and I also understand that the social work degree is being changed so that prospective social workers are fully aware of the criticisms that you've made, to, uh, made today and to use them in a positive way to make these changes and also the constant change of social workers and I heard that impacting today. So my question is really, and I apologise if it's a bit too early, but you know, th the hope that you've got, do you feel confident that this Act will bring about changes within the children's hearing system and within social work, do you feel, is there anything you've seen so far or is there anything that gives you hope that what you're saying, we appreciate it's written in an Act of Parliament, but will it actually happen on the ground? That's basically where I'm coming from. Um, I think from my point of view, um, going back to Christmas when we found out when when, about the Act and the kind of extension and aftercare and the provisions. Uh, I remember speaking to Duncan and I said to Duncan that there was plenty of provisions within the 1995 Children's Scotland Act and that young people um, were and currently are still being failed under the legislation that exists. And for me, I believe that, um, that, there, that systems and structures do need to change and the, the reason why this uh, committee was so successful is because they were independent of these cultures systems that have operated for years, but continuously produced poor outcomes for looked after children. Now, I know with the children's hearing system um, and the Scotch children's reporters that we're working with them to improve their services, the functional aspects of hearings. Um, but for me, it's the culture and at the moment, young people are still homeless. People still use excuses of lack of resources. Um, and these are constant. I, I believe that, the, that currently um, enough systems and structures haven't been changed. And it's the culture. But I also believe, like I said earlier, if, if a young person hasn't got someone alongside them with that only interest is their welfare, um, then this act won't produce any better outcomes than the one before. Could I just ask a, a supplementary on that one? I, I mean, I, I live in the Highland, and mm -hmm. uh, obviously they're uh, ahead of the game, but I actually find it very difficult to get that advocate, whether it's for over 16 or 18. It's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, are you confident that more resources and training will go into advocacy, because I think all of you, Ashley and Caroline and Thomas, you all spoke about that one-to-one -one help and support that gave you that voice. I mean, is that happening? Or I don't, to be honest, I don't, I don't think it will, because of the, the lack of resources that local authorities often uh, talk about, and unless it becomes a, a statutory right, uh, I don't think young people will get the advocacy provision that they need. In Sorry, terms of Kevin, who can I ask, is there a duty to provide or is there a statutory right for each individual to have advocacy? Because there's a big difference mm. there. My, my, my understanding is that there's no duty or statutory. There's no statutory yeah. right to have an advocacy worker. An independent advocacy worker. An independent yeah. advocacy worker. And for me, I think unless, um, unless that happens, yeah. and in some areas there's no advocacy provision, so, yeah. and in other areas... There's maybe one and a half workers. So when I, when I was an advocate, it was me and half a worker for yeah. 3,500 young people. Yeah. Obviously, we didn't work with all of them, 
but um, that was the young people, the numbers who were looked after. So that's key to the success of this uh, piece of legislation? I believe it is. Yes. And do you feel that the changes in the uh, uh, SCRA and the Scottish hearing, uh, the children's hearing system, I appreciate they're not all bedded in yet, but do you feel that's moving in the right direction and uh, hopefully better uh, partnership with social work, do you feel that that culture is changing? Well, certainly from a professional perspective and working in partnership with these agencies, yes. there is a desire. Um, but also, if you look at the fact that the majority of children's hearings take place between nine and five when children are in school, yeah. you would then question, is it the culture that needs to change? Because we're still having hearings, um, taking young people out of school, has a massive impact, massive anxiety, and um, the latest stats have shown that young people, again, in education, um, the, 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 they've dipped again, so in terms of their positive destinations and things like that. So, so, so there are improvements, but again, I, I think it needs to happen at a wider level. We need to keep an eye on these measures. Thank you very much. Um, you said you're from the Highlands, and I think there was a pilot in the Highlands relating to the Act, and I think my understanding is that the Act is going to be um, putting the Gurfik policy into statute, and within Gurfik, um, the, well, the ecological framework of assessment, um, the young person's views are required to be taken into account. However, with the pressures on social work practitioners at the moment, um, I believe hinders their ability to be able to do that independently, especially when they are acting on what they perceive or what they analyse as being in the best interest of that young person. Yeah. And I think what Ashley described in comparison to, what, to the service provision that I received was that there was some, someone there that the basis of their practice was relationship and that built that trust and relationship. Mm -hmm. And it was only when Ashley received someone who, could, who she knew the only obligation wasn't to harm the line manager who was d d uh, dividing resources. It really was hard and it was hard that was directing it was then when um, our assessments are needed were more accurate and then the appropriate intervention was implemented and that's why we believe that all young people in, in the care system in Scotland should have that universal right and a universal understanding of what advocacy is. Thank you. It, it, it's just, uh, just finished there but <laughs> as an MSP for the Highlands since 1999 you know and I've had a lot of people in in the last month and when I ask who's your named person so that I can work with the named person because I think that's important. And, and I haven't got any idea, and that's really where I'm coming from. It's the difference between what's on paper and the duty that we have as members of Parliament to make sure that that is implemented. But thank you all very much. Okay, just while we're on advocacy, let's stick on that just now then. I mean, um, and I'll bring in Neil in one, one moment. Um, just from memory, it's the case that the legislation states that uh, young people's views must be taken into account, but it doesn't state how that must be done. That's the basic line. Okay, sorry. Neil. Um, yeah, in, in terms of, uh, can I thank you all for your, for your testimony again um, this morning? Um, in terms of advocacy, I think you've all kind of touched on that. I just wanted to know if you, you, your thoughts were, do you, do you think every young person should have advocacy or is it just, is it a specific group of young people? Um, what, what sort of role would you see it working as, as opposed to a child social worker? Um, yeah. I think the role of an advocate is completely different from that of a social work practitioner. Um, a social work practitioner has an obligation to work in the best interest of that young person, but an advocate is there to provide information, support, um, and enable them to articulate their views. It adds an extra level of scrutiny onto practice and enables the young person to engage in processes which they tend to find quite difficult, which is like engaging and which is a world leading children's hearing system. Um, and I, I genuinely believe that access to an advocate would enable others to reach more positive outcomes. Um, and I believe today we are here representing young people with care experience, and that's what we would believe that it would be young people with care experience or those who um, engage with the hearing system that have that um, universal right. And I think similarly um, to those who suffer from poor mental health, there is a legal right um, and a universal right and when they engage in legal processes, that they have access to an independent advocate. And I think when young people in care go through similar legal processes, I think it's only right that that 
that universal right is extended to them. Does that make sense? I, 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 yeah, I understand. Yeah, Thank I, I you. understand. Yeah. Um, I th in terms of in terms of general uh, issues, in terms of children, um, you know, looked after children being heard, and, and obviously we talked about what happened in the in the in the committee process, and um, generally. As we move forward, obviously we've done that as part of the bill. As, as we move forward, how do um, local authorities and government best listen to, to young people more generally on, 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 on kind of policy issues? Do you think? Um, I think there's children's champions boards that have been set up in certainly in 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 Renfrewshire, and I, I don't know if anyone's got any contact, uh, comments on, on 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 those and how effective they are and how how, how moving forward we best um, listen to all the the thousands of looked after children that there are? There are um, champions boards in different local authorities in Scotland um, and they are spreading far and wide, which we are very happy to see. Um, I think a champions board gives young people and professionals a chance to meet on common ground. Um, not only that, not only just to discuss what's going wrong, but what is going right as well. Um, because I think it's, it's important that we identify both. Um, not just that, the young people are getting to know their corporate parents um, who you know, may represent them in many different forms. Um, but I think as well, um, from what I can gather from the different champions groups, particularly one in Dundee, there is a very much a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, a sense of growth and development, um, which is very encouraging to see. Um, and I would encourage any other local authority in Scotland that hasn't tried it to give it a go. Um, you won't know unless you try, as the saying goes. Um, and I'm very keen to promote the idea of a champions board. In, in, in terms of young people's identity, I think what the champions board, particularly like the champions board in Dundee, for example, has been able to achieve is something that a lot of care leavers say they lose when they're in that system is that their sense of community and their sense of identity within the community. And what the Champions Board actually does is empowers young people to actually take ownership again of their community. And that could be young people who, for whatever reason, have maybe not lived in their community for numerous years because of their care experience, but come back and actually want to find their voice again, want to, you know, be an active citizen, you know, I mean, things like that, you know, we talk about citizenship and a lot of the times, a lot of these young people don't get to experience that because they're moved from local authority to local authority, placement to placement. And I suppose for myself, it was like trying to re-engage again and trying to re-engage within a community and know how to do it appropriately. Things like the Champions Board gives the opportunity for young people to actually really do that again and to really take ownership and to be that active citizen that most of the other young people get the opportunity to be within their communities. Thank you. Um, Colin. Yeah, we, first, I would like to add my personal thanks also for sharing your stories with us. Uh, I personally find it very, very valuable. Um, we've been talking about adv advocacy. And uh, in relation to children's hearings, um, during when we were taking evidence and also my experience outside that, uh, would indicate that increasingly lawyers are becoming involved in children's hearings, uh, mainly in support of parents' rights. Now, to me, children's hearings were never intended to be a courtroom. And yet, you obviously, you know, if parents believe that they need a lawyer to support their rights and advocate for them, uh, they're entitled to do so. But most people at these hearings are not trained lawyers. What's, what's your experience been of this? What's your feeling about the involvement of lawyers? Does it disempower the children that are at the hearings? And how could it be, how could it be changed? I, if I could give you an, an actual example of um, a, one of the YPWs that Aline managed had went to a hearing um, about Sorry, advocate, I'm saying YPW, I'm getting into who cares speak. <laughs> One of the advocates that Aline Manage had um, attended a children's hearing four weeks ago. And it was quite contentious that the, the parents were no longer together. And basically, the young person had minimal contact with the parents, but the young person had to attend the hearing. So obviously, the young person was there with their advocate. And 
parent turned up with lawyer, um, the, sorry, the mum turned up with lawyer, dad turned up with lawyer, straight away the young person became distressed and really quite upset. The young person asked the panel members if they could speak to the panel members by themselves. That's something that we encourage young people to do if they are feeling quite anxious and quite stressed within that environment. The two lawyers actually argued quite ferociously against it to the point where the panel members or the reporter, sorry, had to actually turn around and say, well, no, the young person was not allowed to be able to give a view by themselves just with the panel members. So the young person ended up walking out, couldn't actually deal with the dynamic of having all these people here. He also couldn't understand why the parents had lawyers when this was supposed to be his meeting. So for me, I think that's an issue and I think it's actually going to get worse and you're going to find that actually the hearing system may become more about the parents and less about the young people and that is very concerning. I mean clearly that's not the intention or the, or the focus of what's trying to be done. The focus should be the young person. Yeah. But how do we deal with that? I mean this may not be something you've got an answer to but parents in hearing views having experienced the, the care system. How can we manage that? I think it's about trying to put the young person at the centre in front of all the decisions that are made in their life. So um, I think when so, uh, parents are represented by solicitors, they're then, the solicitor is then directed by the parent, and no one, they're not at that hearing with the best interest of that child at heart. They're there to, for the best interest of their client. Um, and I think if people are entitled to legal representation, then, then that's their, their legal entitlement. But I think if they're attending a children's hearing, I think we need to have um, probably guidance from government um, uh, and at all levels and to remind people about wh whose hearing it is and what the importance of it being there. And I think in attendance of someone's children's hearing, the only people that should be there is people who have a specific interest um, about that young person's well-being. So you think that stronger guidelines from the government to the children's hearings might be helpful? in yes. terms of uh, managing what the priorities are there. I mean, the priorities should be simple, shouldn't it? I mean, it's, there's, some, there's some general points in terms of uh, this, but we, find, we struggle potentially culturally to really put the children and the young person right at the centre of these processes. There's great things in, again, the Children's Hearing Act 2011, etc., in terms of you know, bold assertions that the child, that, that this is really about them. And yet it is very interesting, if we look at the advocacy issue or their representation to have a voice, that they just don't necessarily have the right to have, uh, have that voice heard. There was a case I talked about the other day where a child said he actually wanted to move placements who called his hearing, as was his right. But then social work were quite determined that this wasn't going to happen, so they were going to attend the hearing uh, and put the point of view about why he should remain where he was. But he did not know he had the right to get any access to any advocacy, so he just didn't bother showing up at his hearing. So it was never actually heard by the hearing in terms of and actually felt what the issues were for him because he didn't have it. And what we have as adults, if we have an issue with our employer, if we've got you know, issues even domestically with you know, a, a divorce or something, we, we're there, we're represented by somebody to make sure our voice is heard and articulated. Yet for these children, we've not even given them that right. And there's big decisions in terms of what's happening with them in terms of how often you meet your siblings. You're taken into care. But, I, you know, that, that sibling relationship really matters, even if the one with the birth parents doesn't, uh, isn't, isn't so important, or whether you're moving foster family or somewhere else. And we know even, you know, the, the guys here today did about, you know, a day, two days preparation to come and speak, and what's probably not dissimilar to the feeling about going to see a children's, a children's hearing in terms of a, a big, very uh, influential uh, uh, forum, it, it takes a lot of courage. And for those children who have far less uh, experience and understanding of what they're you're going through, they just want to get in here and out. They don't necessarily comprehend exactly the implications of what the, the decisions that can be made within, the, within that hearing process. But our biggest realization, and it really was, as, as the guys have alluded to, was um, what the process through talking about our care stories and our care journeys uh, with this committee and with government and, and to a great degree with the public in general, is that we've reclaimed this care identity and this is something people can belong to now. It's the same we've looked at very much within the issues around race, gender, sexuality. This in the same sense is an awakening of a movement which, you know, potentially by accident, we've kicked off together, uh, but it's really grown arms and legs. We've now had over 100 young people claim their care identity 
We've got 40, over 40 plus who are now telling their care stories at a safe place and when its time is right. But we know that we probably only have access to about 15% of the looked after and care experienced young people in this country. And that's not for the want of trying, it's where a certain contract will only let us look at those young people who are in residential care in one area or have seven hours in another area. And it's not that somebody else is doing it in those areas, it just doesn't exist, or at best it will be a children's rights worker who's meant to be delivering that. So our learning is really, wow, look at the power and the benefit it gives to individuals when we give them a voice and when they feel as though they were included. And look what happened when it wasn't present. And, uh, and so what we're trying to say is, we're spending, was it 2.5 billion on a care system? And I know that's an estimate by government. We're spending probably about 0.1 to 0.15% of that budget in hearing a child's voice in this system. And what we know, what we've really come to realize is that this care system works. Anything else, we did it with disability, mental health, that we put the service user or the client or whatever, or the child at the center, like with self-directed support, which you're doing for a lot of other things, is saying, if you're at the center of this, and we hear how you're experiencing this, you're the expert, then we can best define a service for you as an individual. And one guy who's in care, who's still going through a tough time, said, I remember asking him the question, oh, what would you change in the care system? He goes, ah, oh, but that's the problem. It's a care system, isn't it? But I'm an individual. Why don't I actually have a system that suits me, that suits Caroline, Ashley, Thomas, etc.? And it's not there because we don't give that voice. And it's great, corporate parenting in the Children and Young People's Act. It's great, some of the provisions to stay within the, in the care system. But that is the little bit which are those who are delivering their care services. We must, if we want to find out where it's going right, where it's really good for individuals, and where it's not going so hot, is say, let's hear that voice, because we know that we're going to look at the behaviours and go, oh, that child you know, isn't doing very well, they're not on a positive destination at best, in the criminal justice system, you know, in the homelessness system. How do we actually stop judging them for that behaviour and go right back and go, well, how did they experience care? Because it feels like a rejection by society. I was never heard. I don't get this. I don't fit in. And the continued rejection means, in the end, they don't necessarily, do not have the skills to participate in the norms of our culture and the way our society works. So our realisation is this voice to young people has been the most amazing uh, thing to witness and to be part of which is, wow, what happens if we give a lot more young people a voice? So when they go through that difficult time from when they start to be looked after at home or enter the hearing system, etc., we go, you're okay, there's other people with you. You're a sense of belonging. This care identity, and this is very new in the last few months in terms of saying, let's claim this care identity. The sense of power and positive force that's giving to young people has been so palpable in the sense of, that's okay, I don't need to be worried about that label. Like Kevin saying now, in his early to mid-twenties, saying, I can now take off that mask. I can now say I was in care. And it's really important that. So around the houses with it, the one other aspect I would say is you mentioned Champions Board. And Dundee, David Dord, the chief executive there, chairs that group, says it's the best meeting he attends every quarter. And he says he, doesn't, he has the anecdotal evidence. This is making a significant impact on their, um, uh, their educational outcomes of the young people in Dundee because they have a voice, they deal with individual case studies, they change it for them, they say, right, this is our policy for how we'll change it for others. And if we look at this government, it's great, there's attention, this committee's been right at the centre of it. But next week we're in front of the Equal Opportunities Committee, we're in front of the Welfare Reform Committee, we're in front, we've been in front of the Health and Sport, we've been in front of the Finance. And the point is, if we actually just connected all these elements of government and saw this child, in a sense, who looked after one to one and a half percent of our young population, which we know is going to extrapolate out, and currently is up to 50%, plus to 80% of the young people we're locking up and young offenders. 30% of those are going to be homeless. Why wouldn't we focus on them? There's not a fault with them. They're not wired wrongly. And this is one bit I was disappointed in in terms of the inclusion report. Or maybe it was just those really early years stuff and that scar tissue's carried on and we've done our best, but it's, well, it's a shame in terms of what's success for care. These guys have done it. I'm so proud of them for doing it, but it's not by accident. It's by the resilience and by the people who've got around them that have given them a voice within this. And I guess then, so what would really work is, uh, in a sense of saying, there is your voice. Let's connect up government and policy. Let's make sure you have a voice and understand there's something separate to your parents and the care system that is there for you. What do you want to happen? Do you understand what's happening and explain it? Because we're not part of that and we're not part of this. We're here to help you comprehend this whole process that's going through. So 
it is a sense of real credit to you because you've opened our consciousness to this. You give us the self-confidence to do it. And now we really think there is a way for us to really identify what's going right and wrong here. And it'll be down to individuals. It's not the system that'll be broken. It'll be great quality care there and not such a quality care there, a poor decision here. And we will really go on a journey of discovery with this. That's what's so exciting about this. Just to pick up on a couple of points that you made there, and uh, also referring back to some evidence we, we received, are there just too many organisations and people involved in this, in, in the decision-making process? I know when we were taking evidence, um, we took evidence from a large number of bodies, and there were by no means all the people that were involved. I just wonder, given the experience of participants that were shared with us previously, are there too many people involved? And how could that be reduced? I would say that legislation has a minimal intervention principle, and I think um, practice is guided by that, um, by that, by that principle. Um, however, I think it's everybody's responsibility to make sure that young people in care are okay, <laughs> and I think um, we should share that responsibility right across our communities, and that have as many people involved, because just as your children that stay at home will probably have numerous people involved in their life, at whatever clubs they go to, or their school, or just people in the community they know. So. Um, I personally and professionally do not believe that young people have too many people in their life who are there to represent them or who are there with an obligation for them and about their well-being. And I think the responsibility has to be, just like in Gurfik, shared across the community because we're all Scotland's young people and everybody should share in that responsibility. I also think it's probably, for me, it's more about how the agencies are involved. You know, do we have to have a young person sitting at a children's hearing with someone for education, someone from health, you know, someone from their local club, and have all these adults, you know, what about reports? And it's the same with um, looked after reviews as well. Do we need to have the cast of thousands sitting round, you know, and that young person in the middle feeling quite intimidated? Or could people not actually just do something as simple as submit a report. I think we need to be... I, I, I think Thomas is right in terms of it is good to have. I mean, that is... Get Gurfek is having that, you know, support and the multi-agency support around a young person. But I think we need to look at how that support is actually given. You know, do, does there need to be a physical presence? presence? Is there other ways and other creative ways of actually enabling young people to take ownership of their meetings and not having all these adults, you know, having to physically be there? So I think for me, that's probably the challenge is to maybe just, you know, we, we have the building blocks there. We do need the multi-agency approach, but I think it's how we do it, I think. I think could be changed better and actually, you know, and, and could have the young person more at the centre. The young person could have a choice who actually physically attends their meetings, you know. So I think we just need to be a wee bit more creative in terms of how that young person has control of what is their meetings, I think. Caroline, um, at the age of 13, 14, having attended, looked after reviews, um, there was always this lady in the corner that never really spoke. And I asked who she was, and it turns out she was the educational psychologist. And I said, well, what's she doing here? I don't see her. And from that moment on, it was agreed that the educational psychologist would no longer t attend my looked-after reviews because she had no, no relationship with me. She had no input. She wouldn't come and see me at school. Um, she, there was no reason at all for her being there. Um, so I, I have to agree with Caroline. I think it's, it's, it's down to choice as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Joan. Actually, specifically on, on that issue of children's hearings, because one of the things that struck me uh, when we took evidence from the young people was an issue they raised about hearings, um, and they asked if it was possible in advance of the hearing to state what they wanted, and in particular, they were concerned about if they didn't want their parents present if they could say that in advance rather than having to say it in front of the parents, where obviously the issue that Caroline raised is extremely concerning with the parents and the lawyers, but for these young people it was just to be able to put something in place in advance. I know that the hearing system is being reviewed. Is there any indication that that will happen? I think, yeah, as I said before, we are working um, with Children's Hearing Scotland um, and the Scottish Children's Reporters. Um, and there is certainly 
there is certainly changes that, that will be happening. Um, for me, I think, but to go back to, I think the crucial point is, you know, they could send out a questionnaire that said, who would you like at your hearing? Yeah. But it's about asking, identifying, there needs to be a process where the child identifies who they would like to support them at their hearing. Again, who have they got a relationship with? Who's going to be there for them? And that doesn't currently happen. What young people get is, um, is forms called All About Me uh, forms. And it asks them if they like the food where they live and quite functional things. And I don't think it necessarily gets to the heart of why a young person's behaving a certain way, what's actually going on in their life, what support they need. Um, and I think it could be much more individualised, but it's about that young person identifying that person they had the relationship with mm -hmm. to help them and support them. Okay. And also another sort of practical question. It's very apparent from what you've said about your own experiences and others that the role of advocacy needs to be strengthened. Who are the best people to be advocates? I mean, I know people who work in the community as volunteer advocates, but do you think advocates need to be professional people or is it appropriate to have them as volunteers? Yes, because when, if you go to something and work and it's your union representing you, it's going to be somebody that's going to be, either know what it is about your work or they're going to be a professional themselves. And I think when we're asking for representation, we want to be represented as best as we possibly can be. Right. And I think we need to have someone who is qualified to do so, someone who comes from the same value base um, that we come from, um, to enable that we're properly and, and as represented as best as we possibly can be. It's an interesting issue because there's advocacy and there's a whole debate around what advocacy actually is. We believe for the children, young people who are in the care system, are care experienced, they actually need relationship-based, professional, independent advocacy. Now, there's a continuum of advocacy. I'm not getting the detail of this uh, too much. But basically, if you want your foster mum to be your advocate, that's great. But there may well be a conflict of interest because the local authority wants to move you from that foster place when you go over the foster care can't do it. So there needs to be a way and a mechanism whereby there is somebody potentially who's independent who can deal and understand and interpret the process and procedure of the children's hearing that can uh, explain what's going to happen when that occurs, who's there in a young person's terms. So in general, it does need to be more towards the professional end. We're looking far more at some of the group stuff, the peer-to-peer -peer type advocacy in terms of the connection. It's more the youth work element in terms of that's where they connect. Oh, you heard that, you heard this, where Kevin was saying the young people preparing to give evidence to you guys were suddenly understanding they could get access to care leavers grants or whatever else it might be. So there's some really informal stuff. But what we find is really interesting, we're doing quite an intense review about this internally, is it could be, I want to change the colour on my bedroom, but I'm testing you. Can you help make that happen? Because now I'll tell you what I want to happen in my hearing. And now when I've got that relationship with you and I trust you, I want you to come along, then you can actually really help me represent my voice in terms of I want my sibling contact and they're not getting it. Or I don't want to stay in this foster place and have big issues with it. So it is quite, it's interesting and resource-wise, we're certainly not about, uh, in terms of just creating this, an entire industry profession around it, it'd be quite nuanced, but they need to have access to that. And it can't be someone who just turns up at the day, meets you outside and go, oh, I'm your advocate for the day. Because, again, that's another person there's no relationship with. The, the young person needs to, you know, advocate, what does it mean? It's very, you know, you have to explain that to them in terms of, I'm not part of the social work system. You might feel as though care is being done to you. I'm not part of your, your birth family system. I'm just here for you. That can take a bit of time to understand. And in the intensity of being in the process of the hearing and the anxiousness that can come, you don't meet them in the foyer. It needs to happen well before that. And, of course, I would imagine that, in terms of what you're saying, although you want a professional person, there also has to be the commitment to remain with the young person for a long period of time because lack of permanence in terms of the people that you contact are in contact with is a real issue, isn't yeah. it? Well, one thing we determine, because you can never actually determine whether someone will stick forever, we also hope they do. We have some very long-term advocates. Mary still with us. She was with Ashley over 10 years ago, still an advocate in that process. Is we were trying to give them, as an organisation, a relationship with Who Cares Scotland, so we look very much at the fact that you end. Everywhere through your care journey, you end and you transition and you move on to something. 
And we had it that you ended with who kissed Scotland at the age of 25, but now with uh, support of the Life Changes Trust and others, we're actually now looking to extend basically you, when you become, when you enter the care system, you can become a member of who kissed Scotland. It's your organisation, it's your membership, and you don't leave it unless you want to until you die. Uh, so you can be in your 80s, you can be wherever you want, because this is where you belong. Your care experience defines you as having the right to belong to something forever. And that is where the relationship is, therefore, where they can connect with other guys. We're doing now a lot around connecting young people who've just been in care, because there's this whole issue of removing the labels and without the stigma of feeling judged. So they find it actually a really relaxing place and space to do that. Uh, to the same degree whereby someone want to go out publicly and champion and be in places like this and tell their stories, to just others saying, yeah, I'm a member of that, but I know others are doing that, and I'm really chuffed that that's happening. To the fact I've got a relationship with that advocate. So we know it's a wee bit more nuanced, but currently the services are all about how we fix these young people and not really about going at their pace in their journey. Because what we won't do, and we're really clear on, is ever deliver a care service. So we're not going to be opening a supported accommodation you know, in Leith or something, because then we're delivering a service they may well need advocacy. But they do need to belong to something. And this is where this care identity is so key that uh, has been released through this work. Thank you. Jane. Thanks, Convener. Um, and thanks to everybody for their contribution this morning. It's been um, quite humbling to listen to some of your contributions. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about advocacy. Um, in, in my role as a, an MSP, I, I've met with young constituents, and sometimes they have an advocate with them, and sometimes they don't. And, and Thomas talked about how that changes the nature of the engagement, and I've certainly had that experience. It does change it. If a young person's there with an advocate, I, I can't quite say how or why, but I know it does. So I think it's a good thing. Um, and I'm wondering uh, how we can deliver that, because it seems to me it's a bit of a lottery. Sometimes a young person's got an advocate, sometimes they haven't, and I'm thinking, how does this all work? How, how do you get one? I don't know. Um, I completely take the point that they should be independent, but do you think Who's Care Scotland should have a lead role in that? How do we get those, that standard and that access to advocacy um, made more consistent across the country? How do we get the consistency in the leadership in taking that forward? So, also one thing, I mean, yeah, this becomes where we start, we conflicted between speaking for young people and from an organisational perspective, but our major issue is we are conflicted in terms of our independence because we have to, if, where we have it, we have to have a contract with a local authority. And some just choose not to have it with anyone. So you're immediately, let's say, any local authority, they commission you to deliver advocacy to speak up for the young person who's part of their care. It's already a problem. If a significant issue happened, it becomes, you know, that's potentially conflicted. Ideally, and this has come out in Wales the other week, the Welsh Children's Commission was saying around the lack of advocacy provision there, it ought to be a national it ought to be, in my mind, uh, in our mind, in terms of who cares, Scotland, commissioned by government, in terms of we need to make sure, and it's a way of holding to account this care system, that in actual fact advocacy is being commissioned in each local authority area, but by the government to help hold to account and give voice to those young people who are being cared for by the local authority. It needs to be independent structurally and governance-wise from that local authority area, and then it can have true independence. And then you would have more consistency of provision. There'd be a way of, you know, we have a, some visions in this in terms of when you enter care, it's really clear that you're introduced to your advocacy worker. It's made clear that you're part of a different community, but it's very much there with you, people sharing experiences. So there is that element that we totally believe and commit to the fact there needs to be nationally commissioned advocacy that's operating at a local level, because that will give it true independence that will get far better quality information to, uh, to help Parliament hold and, and the government uh, to hold local authorities to account and other corporate parents to hold them to account. Thank you. Uh, Claire Adamson. Um, uh, can I, I just thank you once again. I think, Thomas, you said it was a privilege and honour to be here. I, can, I say in this whole process it's been a privilege and honour for me to work with the people at Who Care Scotland and thank you once again for informing our process um, today. Um, one of the, the things we did look at in uh, the, the, the course of the inquiry was about the decisions about permanence and I just wondered if you were seeing any changes in um, the, um, the time it takes to get to, to, to a permanent placement for young people and if, if you feel that the, the, as you've called it the system is actually taking on board the, the inquiry's recommendations in those areas I think it's 
still quite different, I'd have to say, across the country. You have some local authorities who are making a commitment and a real commitment to actually speed up the process and also engage more with the young people and include the young people in that process. And we've certainly had an increase in referrals um, ac across the board asking for our, our advocates to support young people and just make sure that throughout the process that their views are being shared at every step of the way. But it's still very much a lottery across the country. Um, some of our advocates have got cases where you know the, the, the permanence process gets to about the 11th, 12th month and actually it's still ongoing and there could be varying factors as to why it's taken so long but that young person still sitting there 12 months down the line when they'd been promised you know the forever family type and they still don't have it and you know I, I, I can't you know I, I can't directly pinpoint if there's a specific reason as to why we're still having these long periods of, you know, young people being a part of that process. But it is, there is areas that I can see that it is actually improving, and it's improving very much. And for me, that the key is to actually have the young person engaged and involved in the process right from the start. And a, a lot of the times, you know, our, our, our advocates will take that journey with the young person, and actually, you know, it becomes a really positive thing for them, whereas you get the scenario where you're trying to advocate for the young person who's saying, I've been waiting for 12 month, months for this. So we're seeing bits of improvements, but I still think there's a, there's a bit of a way to go. OK, thank you very much. Um, can I ask one final question um, before we move on? Obviously, we had the inquiry, as this committee did. Uh, we had well, two, two inquiries, which effectively became one. Um, and then we had the Children and Young People Bill, um, which is now an Act of Parliament. I suspect it's very early days yet, uh, very early days, to uh, come to a conclusion on all of that work. But do you think, do you have hope that um, that work and that Act are actually taking the system in the right direction? I'd like to think so. <laughs> um, after you know, all the work that's been put into it. I really hope that we do see something concrete um, coming out of this and the changes that ultimately need to happen. Otherwise, we're going to be sitting here in another 10 years talking about the exact same things. Um, I myself have very high hopes for the Act. Um, you know, I, th I think in some ways, you know, when, when Kevin was speaking about his two brothers that unfortunately died due to not having that support, you know, hopefully that's something we're going to see a drastic improvement in. Um, because at the end of the day, our young people need to be supported. They can't just be left to disappear or to, you know, end up in tragic circumstances that they can't pull themselves back out of. So I myself individually, I have extremely high hopes for this, for this act. And I, I hope in years' time when, you know, universities are offering their social policy courses, then we'll maybe hear about some work of the Children and Young People Scotland Act. So that's my view anyway. I, I would agree with Ashley. I mean, certainly my story demonstrated that actually the support for care leavers, I mean, that was 24 years ago and that actually nothing had changed. And I think what the Act allows corporate parents to do now is to actually think out the box and be a wee bit more creative. I know that people are worried about the impact that it will have, or are we going to have 18, 19 year olds in children's houses? And, you know, that's the kind of thing that I'm hearing in varying local authorities just now. And actually, I don't think that'll be the case. If you ask an 18 or 19 year old, do they want to be in a children's house? No, I don't think they do. What it potentially will enable these 18 and 19 year olds and 20 year olds to have is continuity relationships. I think a lot of the young people that I've worked with over the years, if, if you ask them, you know, what, you know, what was the kind of positive parts of being in care? A lot of it is, well, I had this key worker called Jo, and, you know, she was, I had a brilliant relationship. She was absolutely fabulous. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have got this, this, and this. But then when, when I left the children's unit, she wasn't allowed to work with me anymore. You know, this really allows for the Joes and for the other workers who are so dedicated and who do build relationships with these young people when they're actually within, you know, within the residential establishments to maybe continue it beyond. So, to me, this is about innovation. It's about people thinking out the box. But more importantly, it's actually now about the care leavers being able to say, 
this is the kind of support that I want and actually have it tailored to their own individual needs. I will also uh, share Ashley and Caroline's views with the kind of hope and aspirations of the Act. I'd, in terms of, um, you know, currently there are challenges. We work with young people who um, have to fight for everything to get money, to paint their flats, to get a bed, to get a microwave. And with the Act will come challenges. I hope people, local authorities, decision makers see it as a positive. Um, and that it will help young people to not have to fight for so much. So with the increase of entitlement, I would hope that there will be a change in the culture and that also instead of seeing people as stats or numbers um, on reports, people will get to know young people, will get to understand the real issues that they're facing um, and that they'll implement the Act with young people um, and not for them. Or even to them. <laughs> That's Thomas. I yeah, echo the sentiments of my colleagues here, and I think as a um, qualified practitioner, I find the act to be, or I perceive that to be, extremely empowering. And I think it's the beginning of putting young people at the centre and the forefront of whole everything of, um, sorry, service delivery in general. Um, and I think being able to stay in your care placement and being encouraged to stay in your care placement until you're ready to move on and, and do that transition into independent living. Um, it's literally something that could be life-saving to someone. Um, and hopefully we will begin to see more of Scotland's young people achieving positive outcomes. I'm one of seven, and not all of my, my siblings have managed to achieve positive outcomes. Um, and I'd just like to see more people being empowered to do the same as me. Thank you. Thank you. I guess that... I, yeah, it's a, it was a really positive moment. For me, the, the, the biggest issue was... It sounds like interesting language. What was kind of happening with this? Because I remember sitting in the, in the Parliament on February the 19th when this was passed through several hours of the debate. And the one issue that there wasn't a pinhead of difference on across political parties, and this really said it for us, was, was on this issue about raising the age of leaving care. Because you all said you'd listen to the young person's voice. And that, for me, was it. We, we've known this. Well, we haven't known. We've lived with this issue for generations in terms of poor outcomes of children we're actually spending a huge amount of money on in the sense of, finally, it seemed to be a sense of, ah, this is what we've heard from them. Here is a solution. We look after them for longer. If it is with long, we're aiming to get them in long-term, trusting, loving, stable relationships. That's where the key is. How do we make sure they're within that? There's big challenges in this. What's the culture? Or how can I get away with implementing this in terms of what comes out in guidance? Can I turn, change the name of a homeless accommodation into supported accommodation? That won't work. Some of that stuff might happen. This is where we need to be right on top of it in terms of scrutinising how this is actually implemented. There's big challenges which none of us have come up with the answer with yet, which in terms of how do we do return to care. The intention was there, but we didn't have the blueprint. That needs to be followed through, because those to a degree are the most vulnerable. Leaving at 16, yeah, I can conquer the world, and realising two or three months later I can't, but I can't get back in because my bed's gone in that unit. So in that residential house, so there's huge challenges. But for me, what's really happened, and it's, what, it's really worth knowing, we've had people from Scandinavia to New Zealand, etc., looking at what's happened around this care identity, saying, they've kind of lifted the lid on something there, and we can't put it back on in terms of it's such a positive force. How have you done that? You're embracing a care identity. And along with what I was so chuffed to see with you know, parliamentarians getting this issue, understanding, yeah, right, this is maybe a solution to this, is seeing what these guys have done, and real credit, uh, I'm so proud of them in terms of them telling the stories and taking ownership of this, because it's going to places not many of us would ever talk about in terms of telling the stories and helping us understand their lives so we can make better change. Because what we really want to see is to stop judging their behaviour, but to see that as, ah, oh, we got something wrong there, how do we get it right? So great optimism with the app, but we're going to have to keep our eye on it. I think that's a good place to, to, to sum up that uh, this, this committee has made a commitment, though, to, to do just that. Uh, hopefully, do slightly more than just keep an eye on it. But uh, um, uh, I think we share the, uh, uh, we have a shared outcome in mind. Um, and uh, both you and this committee, well, I'm sure, will carry on working towards that shared outcome um, with many challenges ahead, I'm sure, um, but hopefully with some optimism. As well, can I thank you once again on behalf of the committee of, for coming along this morning and giving your evidence. Next week, we will take evidence from Scottish government officials um, on the progress made on the inquiry to date. Um, and before I close the meeting, can I ask both the witness panel and the members of the committee to stay in place for a few minutes after the meeting? Thank you, and I close the meeting. <laughs>